Good evening, everyone. It's nice to see you here. Um, and uh, glad, to, glad that people turned out. We had to reschedule the event because of Hurricane Sandy. Um, so we're happy to see you all here. And, and maybe I can ask people in the back to move up a little bit, make this a little bit cozier discussion. So welcome. I'm Lee Bell. I'm director of the education program at Barnard and a member of the interdisciplinary faculty committee that is hosting this three-year project for the public good. Uh, this is our second year of the project and our goal as a group is to critically examine current efforts to privatize areas of life that have traditionally been public to consider the dangers to democracy when we see public oversight to private profit-driven entities, whether schools, social services, healthcare, uh, the juvenile justice system, just to name a few of, um, of the recent experiments in privatization. And to refocus our attention to the common problems we face as a society and ways that we can renew our commitment to public institutions and democratic accountability. Before I introduce our speaker for tonight, I want to tell you about our next event in the series this, that's upcoming this spring. We'll have a photography exhibit called Claiming Citizenship. This exhibit brings together photographs from the Library of Congress to portray how African Americans were able to utilize New Deal programs to claim citizenship in the years leading up to the Civil Rights Movement. Historian and curator of that exhibit, Ricky Salinger, will be here to talk about the exhibit in the context of the New Deal. And then Dorian Warren, who's a faculty member in SEPA and affiliate of the Roosevelt Institute, will talk about the new New Deal um, that we need. So stay tuned for that um, in the spring. It'll be in the spring catalog. Uh, I believe it's March 27th. It's a Wednesday. But Stay tuned, and if you signed up out there, you'll get emails from us about the next event. Tonight, we have the distinct pleasure of hearing from Heather McGee, Vice President of Policy and Outreach at DEMOS, an organization that's dedicated to influencing public debate and creative action to achieve a more equitable economy with opportunity for all, a, robust, a more robust democracy in which all Americans are empowered to participate, and a stronger public sector that can provide for our common interests and shared needs. These are issues of particular importance to millennials. Those of you born between 1970 and 2000, Heather has called this group, of which she's a member, um, the quote, guinea pigs of the experiment in trickled down economics, an experiment that has led to the financial meltdown of recent years and an inequality gap where the United States ranks among the highest in international comparisons, not something we should be proud of, and where New York State ranks the highest in the nation in terms of the inequality. Um, quoting Michelle Fine, these are most precarious times, financially, politically, ideologically, and intellectually, unless we, students, faculty, researchers, policymakers, citizens, activists, redress the unregulated rush to privatize, unless we reclaim the soul of the public, you could be the pruned, what she calls the pruned generation, among the last to enjoy the sweet roots of public support. Fortunately, Heather McGee has a clear vision for both what is wrong and what is necessary to address the current crisis. She's a frequent writer, speaker, and media commentator on MSNBC, Fox News, and CNN. Um, you could have caught her last, uh, this past Sunday on Melissa Harris Perry's show on Sunday morning. Her opinions, writing, and research have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, National Public Radio, The Washington Post, and The New York Times. She's a contributor to the book, Inequality Matters, The Growing Economic Divide in America and Its Poisonous Consequences, uh, New Press, 2005. Heather holds a BA in American Studies from Yale and a JD degree from the University of California at Berkeley. 
I had the pleasure of hearing Heather speak last year at a Kellogg Foundation conference, and I can tell you that she is truly an inspiration. So please join me in welcoming Heather to Barnard. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Lee, for uh, plucking me out of, uh, out of a dreary day of emails with an invitation to speak here. Uh, I think it was early in the summer and um, for giving a, a few of my friends who went to Barnard uh, the delight of opening up their sort of alumni calendar, you know, fall schedule and seeing my face. That was really very funny for many of them. Um, so I'm really glad to be here tonight, and I am sorry that Sandy derailed uh, my first appointment, but uh, fortunately this is going to be videotaped, so those of you who have friends who couldn't make it um, will be able to uh, to direct them to YouTube or to wherever the site will be. Right. Um, so, as Lee said, I, I'm the vice president for policy and outreach for an organization called Demos, and, and I didn't know before I joined this organization. I started working there for the first time pretty soon after I graduated from college, and I didn't know what Demos meant. Um, it is actually the Greek word for the people of a nation, and it's the root word of democracy. That's a pretty highfalutin name for an organization, um, but the more I've worked here, uh, the more I've come to really love it, because um, the, the issues that really animate me are ones of economic justice and how we organize our economy to make sure that people's basic needs are met and that they can really fulfill their dreams. And yet, when it comes down to it, in an economy, it really actually does all come down to our democracy. Because in a democracy, the people write the rules for our economy. And one of the earliest things I found out when I started working in the, er uh, the arena of public policy was that the economy is not like the weather. And that was sort of surprising to me. Because if you think about all the kind of metaphors that we use and all the signs that there are, the way we talk about the economy, um, the way we think about people's economic success, it really does sometimes feel quite um, disembodied, quite like the weather. I mean, you know, when you're driving home at night, I suppose I can't say that in New York, when you're <laughs> listening to the radio in the morning when you wake up, um, you know, what do you hear? You hear the stock market numbers, sort of like the temperature report. Right? You, you hear about the, the unemployment numbers coming in like it's you know, a storm coming in. It's very, um, it's, it's very much, and I think most people who don't study this at all would say, yeah, I mean, the economy is something you sort of have to batten down the hatches when the economy goes bad, right? Um, and what we don't realize, and cognitive scientists have actually studied this, what we don't realize is how much it is a structural system that some people, and in a not ideally functioning democracy, too few people are always changing and modifying the rules for. So the economy is not the weather. I think that's an important sort of conceptual thing to hold on to. And I tried to think, I was giving a speech to my um, high school alma mater. Right, so this, you know, and, and it was actually, it's a school that has junior high students in it as well. So it was like seventh graders. So I was trying to think of how to explain this and replace it with a metaphor that might be sort of, um, might resonate with them. And I thought about a game, a sort of massive multiplayer game where the most powerful players and, you know, whether it's business executives or government officials, policy makers, are constantly changing the rules of the game to make it easier for one team or another, for individual players to get ahead or to fall behind. And I thought that, that that worked a little bit because it also made us think about the way we think about individual effort and skill, right? We, you know, the American dream we think of as an individual pursuit. How well you do in the economy is about how well you get yourself educated, how smart you are, how uh, diligent you are about sending your, out your resumes when you graduate, about getting that internship. And likewise in sports, individual effort. Or in a game, individual effort and determination and skill, of course they matter. But it also matters, oftentimes the most, what team you start out on. And that is certainly the case in our economy. 
And of course, fundamentally, it matters to the outcome of the game what the rules are, right? If there's an offside rule, that can totally change uh, the outcome of, this, of the game. And so the rules that we construct to shape economic outcomes are, in fact, the most important thing. And that is where our democracy at least should come in. And I, I'm often challenging myself to think about the rules that are enabling people today and in history to succeed or fail or to feel like they're running in place uh, and not getting ahead. And I got into this work first because I was asking myself questions about the economy that didn't seem like they could be answered just by thinking about individual skill and determination. Like, when everybody tells us that college is so important, right, individual effort, why are tuition and fees so expensive when they didn't used to be for our parents and our grandparents when college wasn't as important? At Demos, we've done research to really sort of try to unpack that question, and we found in a report that you can find it on our website, it's called The Great Cost Shift, that since 1990, just since 1990, so just 20 something years ago, not you know in the great good old 50s, but just 20 years ago, the amount of money that state governments contributed to their in-state college um, and higher education systems has dropped per pupil by 26 cents on the dollar. Why are there so many jobs? And not easy jobs either, but hard, on your feet all day, back-breaking jobs, demoralizing, dehumanizing jobs, where people can work all day and night and still not have enough money to be able to afford groceries and rent without going into debt. Why, are, why is that kind of job so prevalent in our economy today? That's timely. Again, today, we saw across New York City, fast food workers go on strike at Wendy's and Papa John's and McDonald's and Burger King and Taco Bell to say that the measly wages that they make are not enough. Because those are the American jobs now. And we actually also recently just did a report at Demos where we looked at the retail sector, where I've certainly worked, I'm sure many of the people in this room have worked, and where wages are stubbornly low where people are pulling home uh, $8 an hour, and they're trying to raise families on that because those are the jobs that are available. And we argued, and we did some research to show that actually raising the floor of those jobs to $12.25 an hour, about $25,000 a year, still not a lot, but for a low-wage job, would actually be a huge boon to the economy, would lift 700,000 people out of poverty, uh, would create 130,000 jobs, and would be a take-home pay uh, increase for five million people. That was just at the biggest retailers in the country. And it would all be relatively affordable for those companies as well, and if they pass them on to consumers, it would cost us about 15 cents more per shopping trip. And as we saw last week, when workers at a nearly 1,000 Walmart stores across the country went on strike to say, we need a better Walmart if this is going to be our country's biggest employer, we're proving that that question of what kind of economy do we want for our country is resonating with the people whose voices have been the most silent in our democracy lately. But you know, there was a time in American history when the rules of the economic game were very different than what I've just described. And there were a lot more winners in that game. It was a time when liberal economic policies helped create what I think was America's greatest invention which wasn't the solar panel or the combustion engine, those were all great, or the light bulb, also great, also an American invention, but the middle class. No country had ever done what we did in um, basically our grandparents' time, which was say that regular working people without a lot of education but determined could work all day and actually afford a roof over their head, save money for the future, have a middle class lifestyle. That was something that we created, we invented in this country through public policy. And tens of millions of Americans reached an unprecedented level of, of, of economic security and, and frankly freedom, because there's a freedom to feeling like you are not constantly behind and scraping. And many of them were the children of European immigrants, and some of them were even African Americans who had migrated internally from the south to the northern industrial cities, like my grandparents who moved from Mississippi to Chicago and worked in the unionized steel mills and then 
for the public sector as a cop and a social worker in the jobs that didn't discriminate at that time. And at this time, one man, it was always a man, with a high school diploma could have a unionized factory job and support a wife and children by home, have health care and a guaranteed retirement pension to look forward to. If he wanted to go to college, like my grandfather did after a few years of working in the steel mills, he could with a free government grant. And even if you didn't have that grant, tuition was incredibly low because it was so subsidized by the public. And in that scenario, the CEO of the company that that man worked for would have made on average about 25 times what the average employee of that country, company made. The government at that time collected far more in taxes and far more from those who could afford it, the wealthy and corporations. Marginal tax rate at that time was near 90%. And reinvested that money in America's people and in our future, creating the national highway system, uh, research and development that private companies would then go on to exploit and market to their own private wealth, enacting the GI Bill that put a generation to college on grants and made loans affordable for home ownership and not just on an exploding teaser rate as we've seen in our time, and making home ownership affordable for millions of people. And that's just not the role that the public sector is playing today, nor is it the role that our greatest, largest businesses are paying today. Today, it typically takes both parents working to have that kind of security. It takes college degrees paid for mostly with loans, as I'm sure most of the women in this room know. And even still, families have expensive, uncertain health insurance and a retirement account that could disappear with a bad quarter on the stock market, and they have to fund themselves from their paychecks. And the typical CEO today pays himself nearly 300 times what he pays his average worker. So I asked at the beginning of my career, what happened to change our economy so much? And a lot of people will say it was progress, it was globalization, it was technological change, it was the end of the industrial era, we moved into the information age, and that's just what happened. But that sounds a lot like the weather to me, right? It's true, those changes did occur and they brought new competition from other countries, a new premium on education, but our politics changed and our public values changed as well. And they shifted the bedrock of beliefs that people, particularly the powerful people in our society, had about the answer to a fundamental question, which is what is the game for? What is all of this for? What should guide our decisions about the rules that we make around our economy? What is the fundamental purpose? And back in 1963, Bobby Kennedy summed it up this way, and I'm not going to do a Massachusetts accent. <laughs> he said, it is the essence of responsibility to put the public good ahead of private gain. This is a very wealthy man who said that. Fast forward to 1982, when President Reagan, first president of my lifetime, boasted about wanting, above all, to see an America in which people can still get rich. And he wasn't alone. Leaders and economists in both parties began to believe that the best way for everyone to succeed was if the rules were written to ensure the greatest possible accumulation of wealth at the top and the biggest profits at the biggest corporations. And then the money would trickle down to the rest of America. This really was a bipartisan belief, and it really did begin around the time that our generation was coming into existence. So what were the rules that needed to change under this new guiding principle? And I'll just give a few examples. Since it's easier for some people to, particularly people who are invested in the stock market and who are executives at a company, not just the workers, to get rich, if corporate profits are high because the costs of doing business, particularly the cost of hiring workers and employing them, is low, organized business began lobbying in the 1970s, began organizing itself, taking some lessons from, uh, from the campus uh, organizing at the time. The Chamber of Commerce, which is the largest national lobbying organization, 
has spent nearly $1 billion lobbying over just the past 10 years since they were required to disclose it. And one of their main targets is to keep the minimum wage low. The minimum wage has lost nearly half of its purchasing power since 1968. The rules of the economic game were also changed to make it easier for businesses to ship jobs to places with cheaper, cheaper and more easily exploitable workers, to avoid paying their taxes, and to influence our elected officials. That's something I'll get back to in a second. And a major reason why decisions kept being made that so clearly made average, people working off, average working people worse off is that the rules changed to make it easier for businesses to resist what used to be a protected right that people fought for and died for in this country, which is the right to join together in a little miniature democracy in your workplace and form a union. And that has meant the, peop the voice of the people who simply work for a living has been muzzled at our leading corporations, like the rabidly anti-union, largest private employer in the country, Walmart, which has no union, which replaced GM, a company that helped build the middle class as our leading employer. And also, the voice of working people has been muzzled in the halls of power, because unions are often the lone voice lobbying for people who depend on paychecks in state houses and in Washington. And one of the most dramatic rule changes was the one that shifted responsibility for paying taxes to keep our country growing from corporations and people who are already wealthy further onto individuals of modest means. Just since 1980, the top tax rate on money that comes from stocks and bonds and assets and investments has fallen by half while it's gone up on middle class paychecks by 8%. That's how today, as you might recall from the election, a millionaire can pay a lower tax rate on his stock market gains than his nanny or his janitor pays on their paycheck. Back in 1955, corporations actually used to contribute nearly 30% of federal tax revenues. Today it's just 9%. And dozens of the most successful U.S. businesses, I love this, actually spend more on lobbying and on bonuses every year than they contribute to their country in taxes. And since I'm here at Barnard, I want to take a moment to focus particularly on what this has all meant for our generation. And it simply meant that we, the generation that has come of age during all of these rule changes to our economy, is actually the first generation to be worse off economically than our parents. Young men today make about um, 90 cents on the dollar of what their parents, their fathers made. Young women make about a dollar four on the dollar that their mothers earned. This is just generational comparisons. But that, you should hope that was the case, considering that so many women didn't work and didn't have higher education a generation ago. And still, young women are making less than young men made a generation ago, than yes, than less than their fathers made. We also have to deal with childcare. We have two uh, incomes working, two people earning incomes, and so we have the completely essentially uncompensated or un, un, unsubsidized for the most part, except for the very poorest of families, and even then there's a waiting list, for something as fundamental as the thing we're supposed to do as good American citizens to keep this country populated, right, which is have families. We have been, until the Affordable Care Act, the leading group of the uninsured young adults have been, and we have been really hard hit by the financial crisis. Unemployment among young adults is at record levels and without much signs of abating, particularly for non-college edu educated youth. And at the same time as these rules changed to make it easier for just a small sliver of us, relatively speaking, to amass and keep unprecedented wealth, the rules didn't change to keep up with the changing times in ways that would have given more people a leg up. And that's sort of one of those pieces that I think we often don't think about, is how much, what are the things that were left off the table completely? What are the solutions, the common solutions to the things that privately keep us up at night that could be there, like universal childcare, um, like debt-free college, um, like 
family leave. We are one of the only nations, industrialized nations in the world that doesn't guarantee some sort of paid leave when you get sick or when you have a child, which virtually everyone will do at some point. Have to care for an elderly parent, get sick themselves, have a child, adopt a child. We could have provided more generous unemployment insurance if we know that it's gonna be a, an era of sort of easy layoffs and downsizing. Less than half of workers actually even are eligible for the unemployment insurance that we are always desperately fighting for in Washington to keep extended during this recession. So you may be wondering why it is that when life has gotten so much harder for so many people, that our government has done more to respond to these common problems. And that the, public, the political conversation really until recently hasn't even been about the issues I'm talking about. And this is where I argue that our democracy has become as unequal as our economy. Because over the course of my lifetime, an entire new industry has appeared, and that is corporate lobbyists. I used to work in Washington, and I can tell you, it's astonishing. For every, tw when, for every member of Congress, there are 24 registered lobbyists. Big money campaign contributions, which both serve to create a sense among most people in the country, all ideological stripes, that our system is corrupt, thereby uh, lowering our faith in government and what it could be and could do for us, and which really serves to make sure that the donor class, the class of people who are able to write $1,000 and $10,000 checks, their voices are amplified in the ears of our elected officials and the voices of people who, for whom $5 would be a lot is basically silenced. Nearly one out of every three minutes that elected officials in Washington spend on the Hill is spent fundraising, talking to people who can write $10,000 checks. So you wonder why we can't close the hedge fund loophole, and you wonder why the uh, the conversation in Washington is so often about what protects uh, corporate interests, lobbyists, and the very wealthy. And I'm not saying that every business at all, or even every big business, or even every big business in Washington is out to push policies that disadvantage families. But it's the sum total of the flood of cash that drowns out the voices of everyday people. Princeton political scientist Larry Bartels has found that, quote, the preferences of people at the bottom third of the income distribution have exactly no apparent impact on the behavior of their elected officials. None. But I think that beyond just what happened to the rules of our democracy, that something else happened in our culture over this period of time because it's become somehow politically acceptable to evade taxes as if companies and individuals owe nothing to their neighbors or to the country they live in. It's become culturally acceptable to assert that any kind of public help, whether it's healthcare or unemployment insurance, is unfair redistribution from worthy job creators to undeserving freeloaders. It's become acceptable in our culture to demonize the class of people that earlier were known as the little guy, the little guy that you root for. And this, I believe, is where the increasingly unexamined role of unconscious bias and prejudice comes into our culture in ways that are eroding opportunity for all of us. Since the end of the civil rights era, we have had a deep and growing anxiety in this country about exactly who gets to be an American and exactly who is a real American. And it's that anxiety that I think is allowing those more selfish values to take root in our public culture, even among people who have been suffering economically under these new rules. And it's funny that I have to say that it happened at the, since the end of the civil rights era, because that seems counterintuitive. But two things happened at once in the mid-1960s. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 finally decreed that the law could not segregate or discriminate based on skin color, which upset the social order. 
and the Immigration Act of 1965 liberalized our immigration laws. Did you know, I didn't until maybe five or six years ago, that the United States had racial limits on who could legally immigrate into this country until 1965? Good, heads nodding, yes, I'm at Barnard, of course I know that. There was a strict number that was limited to Asians, a strict limit on the number of Asians and Africans, for example, and even a limit on the number of Southern and Eastern Europeans who were considered ethnic. Now, Northern Europeans had no limit. Think about that. And so when that finally changed in the rush of shaking off conscious and explicit racism in the 1960s, the next 40 plus years saw this amazing transformation in the physical appearance of who is an American. And that all really began after the civil rights movement faded. And so the question is why does this new diversity, this new diversity in a period of time after our big public conversation about the need for tolerance and integration was quieted down, why does that matter? to Americans' feelings about public solutions to common problems, about economic fairness and redistribution and taxes and jobs? Is it because we're all racist? You pause and take some water for you to cogitate on that. <laughs> no, that's not why. Um, no, but also not quite, not at all either. Because the human brain naturally puts objects and ideas and people into categories. It's part of our great intelligence, actually. It's how we learn. And it naturally takes shortcuts to do those categorizations. You know, that red round thing on the table is an apple, and all apples are apples, Fiji, Macintosh or not. And that orange round thing on that table is an orange, whether it's navel or mandarin or not. And I learn quickly as I'm growing up that apples are sweet and oranges are tart. And I start to put things in categories based on their physical descriptors. And our brain categorizes that way, and our brain categorizes people that way. And to go beyond that, it finds shortcuts to give meaningful attributes to those categories that we have. And most of those shortcuts and meanings are going on subconsciously. The vast majority of our neural processes and connections are happening completely without our conscious awareness. So the problem is that our society has been so hierarchical for so long and remains so to this day along these lines of physical appearance, of race and gender and age, that the shortcuts that we are constantly primed to make to give meaning to those different categories have unequal consequences. Studies of implicit bias out of Harvard, which if you haven't gone onto the website and taken the implicit bias test, I highly recommend that you do. It's often a rude awakening, but then also sometimes, I think, quite liberating to just acknowledge that these biases are there within us. These studies ask you, it's a simple computer game that you can do, to quickly associate words with faces. And they demonstrate that we are nearly universally less able to quickly associate darker faces with positive words. Though it is true that white respondents find it harder to make that association between darker faces and positive words than uh, people of color do. However, there is still that prejudice, that unconscious bias, that unconscious difficulty of creating a positive word association with darker faces among people of color as well. Because prejudice and stereotyping and racial hierarchy, it's part of the oxygen we breathe in this country. And some of us have worked hard to develop a better metabolism for that oxygen, but it is still part of the oxygen that we breathe. And some people in our politics know that and are really good at using it to their own ends. I, I want to read a quote from Lee Atwater, who was the author of The Southern, The Architect, author as well, of the Southern strategy that massively shifted the political alignment in this country just around the same time period when our economic rules shifted. He says, this was a quote that was discovered, he was talking to a journalist in the early 80s, 
You start out in 1954 by saying nigger, nigger, nigger. By 1968, you can't say nigger. That hurts you. It backfires. So you say stuff like forced busing, states' rights, and all that stuff in 1968. You're getting so abstract now that you're talking about cutting taxes. And all these things that you're talking about are totally economic things. And a byproduct of them is that blacks get hurt, hurt worse than whites. And subconsciously, maybe that is part of it. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that if it is getting that abstract and that coded, that we are doing away with the racial problem one way or the other. You follow me? Because obviously sitting around saying, we want to cut this, is much more abstract than even the busing thing. And a hell of a lot more abstract than nigger, nigger. We want to cut this. That's where we are right now. That is where we are, have found ourselves at a time of nearly unprecedented economic pain, at a time with our first African-American president, at a time when this mess that we are in economically that is hurting so many people has been through no fault of their own, but in fact, through the fault of a set of economic rules that I've just described that are really about taking away from the public creating a collection of power, economic power and political power in the hands of a few. And that's what we're talking about in Washington today, not how to reinvest in our common people, not how to build for the future, not how to create debt-free higher education, not how to fix our democracy, but what to cut. And when I think about the time when Henry Ford and Dwight Eisenhower and the United Auto Workers president Walter Ruther signed this kind of social contract together, right? We talk about that. We talk about a time when, in the late 1950s, when that one man could just have that great union job, and it was a real feeling, and historians talk about this, economists talk about it, where there was a shared social contract, and it was government and workers, represented by labor, and businesses were sort of in it together to create a highly productive and consumptive middle class. I think about who those men were and how I picture them sort of sitting at this bargaining table signing this social contract. And I think about the fact that it was a lot easier for them to feel like they were sitting across the table from their fellow American, from their brother. And I'm not minimizing by any means the class struggle that was overcome to create the amount of labor power that there was. But I am saying that you're a lot more likely to want to invest in someone you feel is your brother, to share your rewards with your brother, to lift the floor to help out your brother. But now, because of the successes of our parents and grandparents in the 1960s and 70s, there are more signatories to that social contract. There are women. There are Latinos, there are Asians, there are African American, there are LBGT people. And it's been completely torn apart, and people have walked away from that contract. You know, those other industrialized nations that progressives look to and say, oh, they spend 25% of their GDP on social spending. They have this robust safety net. Well, we're not Sweden, because we're not Sweden, because the this country looks like this room. And so I'm not saying that that means we can't achieve that kind of social contract when there are more signatories to it, but I'm saying it's not easy. And I'm saying that it's actually impossible if you don't acknowledge how hard that is. We need to take in this country a bit of old-fashioned American pride in recognizing that we are the world's greatest experiment in democracy a multi-origin, multi-racial, multi-ethnic democracy, where we say that people can come from anywhere across the globe, people with roots and ancestors from everywhere on the planet can live in this country, speak different languages, eat different food, never see each other because we're so geographically diverse, and yet all have an equal say and afford one another an equal chance. That is really, really hard. It is the source of our exceptionalism. 
And yet, over our lifetime, as we know, the public conversation about the impact that racial and ethnic difference has has been silenced. We're not supposed to talk about it. It's racist to even talk about race. The Supreme Court is about to tell us that it's racist to acknowledge any racial differences and, and, and look for diversity in our college classrooms. That's racist. Because the problem is if we don't acknowledge our racial hierarchy and biases, as we become an even more diverse nation with every child born in this country, we become more and more diverse. Our entire society will continue to fall victim to the inequities, to the instability, and to the insecurity that comes when we don't feel like we're all in it together. When people are allowed to just be in it for themselves and have that be acceptable as part of our culture. So I work in the field of economic policy. And when I think about the last time that we were ever really having a rich conversation in this country that called to our better angels about race and difference and gender, Dr. King was moving to a place where he saw racial justice and economic justice as deeply intertwined and as essential one for the other. And he called this vision of economic justice the brotherhood of man. Now putting aside the gender part of that formulation, I think about the idea of having the brotherhood of man be what guides our thinking when we set the rules in this democracy for economic policy. And I'll tell you when I am debating solutions to the unemployment crisis or the so-called fiscal crisis in Washington or when I'm on CNBC and Fox, when I'm lobbying the White House, no one's really talking about the Brotherhood of Man. But let's do a thought experiment as to what it would be like if we were. And I think it would look like people being proud to pay taxes because that's paying back the investment that this country made in your success through roads and schools and public utilities and defense and public research and patents, you name it, and feeling like you need to help provide for our common future even though you may not recognize what the future looks like. And I think it would look like government and business and philanthropies working together to ensure that the basics of life, a great education, a roof over your head, a way to care to your, for your children and your, sick, and your parents and yourself when you're sick without going bankrupt in old age with dignity, that these would be the minimum things that we could guarantee for us all and not be out of reach for so many Americans. And I think it would look like the CEOs of American companies seeing their job not just to create goods or services and profits and shareholder value for an already wealthier investor class, but to create good jobs as well, decent jobs, jobs with dignity, jobs you can be proud of creating for their fellow human beings. Because I think that when we say that the CEO of Walmart, for example, is worth $10,000 an hour, which is what his salary is, whereas his coworker is worth $7 an hour in the US, pennies an hour in the factory in India or Malaysia where the product on the shelves is actually made, that means something. That tells our categorizing brain something. Because when you see two models of a phone in a store and one is 30 bucks and one is 300 bucks, you decide that the $300 one is better. And it is so easy to apply that same logic to human beings. And that's what we're doing. And that's really wrong, I think. So I want to leave you with a reminder that when Dr. King talked about having a dream, that dream 
is one that is still unfulfilled. And that we, I'm skipping over the professors in the room now, that we, the millennial generation, are actually truly the children of that dream. And we haven't yet realized it. And we're not the children of that dream just because, you know, when he talked about little black children and little white children holding hands, he would never have been able to imagine, even him, that that would have included such a diverse population of youth in this country. But I think we are the children of that dream because it's going to be left to us to realize it. We haven't yet attained the brotherhood of man in this country, not at all. In fact, as our racial anxieties have gone underground since the civil rights movement quieted, we've lost ground in achieving economic justice in this country for everyone. When you create a scaffolding of hierarchy, it may be created in a racial way in this country, but once the scaffolding is there, millions of people can end up in the lower rungs of all colors. But fortunately for our generation, we've grown up. That Reagan quote was when I was two years old. We've grown up hearing that you're on your own. And our generation has actually decided that no, we're not. Our generation is the generation that was at Zuccotti Park and that is in Clinton Hill saying that the, the response to a manufactured, man-made climate crisis is to come together, not to fall apart. And if you look at public opinion polling at, at the generational level, more than any other generation since the Depression era generation, which they call the greatest generation, but I promise you it's not, we actually believe in individual sacrificing for the common good. We believe in doing something more than seeking out private gain, which is kind of ironic because we are the first generation to really, really need a lot more private gain, gain than our parents did. And I believe that it's going to be our generation that is finally going to achieve a sustainable economy, an economy where everyone, regardless of the zip code that they were born into or the school district, actually meets their basic needs and has a shot at fulfilling their dreams. And you know, I, I think about often when I'm um, in rooms where we are all relatively privileged in comparison to the vast majority of people in the country. And I think about sort of what that means. And I, I actually don't think that that means that we should avoid questions of economic inequality just because we actually even though we oftentimes don't feel it, are very much at the top of the economic ladder in terms of our incomes and our opportunities. Our relative privilege is an opportunity because what is privilege but power? And what is power but the ability to make change? So we can choose to use our power in ways that make opportunity possible for people across this country and across this globe. It is all possible. The American dream didn't just happen. The middle class didn't just create itself. The rules, our rules, the economy is not the weather. We can rewrite the rules to create the kind of society that we want. Thank you. Thank you. So I, there is time for questions, which is my favorite part. So um, I think there's someone coming with a microphone. And for our, it to be recorded well, people have to wait until the microphone comes. There's someone, I should put my glasses on. Wait until the microphone comes in order to, um, to be heard and recorded. So uh, OK, hands again. Sorry, everybody put their hand down there. Okay. Right there in the back, you were the first one with your hand. Hi, you uh, gave a very empowering 
message. It might, it might sound somewhat defeative, but it is empowering. I believe you are speaking directly to rising up, standing up, and acting up. And thank you for saying climate crisis. And I have one question, but I just want to make a correction regarding the climate. Please don't use the word hurricane. It was, when it hit, it was a post-tropical cyclone. The insurance industry would love to pervert it into a hurricane to inflate rates. Hmm. Okay. My question is two entities that uh, you're probably well aware of. The first is ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council. Yep. And the second one has angered a good population of the world. The nickname is TPP, it's also known as NAFTA on steroids, mm -hmm. and what your opinions are. Sure. Um, so TPP is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and uh, it is a uh, new proposal uh, to for a sort of free trade uh, alliance in the Pacific that would be uh, create new rules for for global trade in uh, in the Pacific between the United States and Pacific countries. And Alec is the American Legislative Exchange Council, which is actually quite old. It's about thirty years old, but uh, was created at around this time uh, that you know we were born. Everything went to hell in a handbasket, and uh, it um, is a way for conservative think tanks and lobbyists from corporations to write bills and talking points and research studies to support them and also make campaign contributions to conservative legislators at the state level. It's really quite brilliant. Um, and so it's how we get to see the same law being dropped in 40 states and you know, causing people who would want to sort of oppose the law, advocacy groups, you know, community groups, to kind of have to scramble. Um, and it's how we've seen a lot of really uh, anti-public good laws from the um, kill at will laws that we saw that allowed Trayvon Martin's assailant to murder or to, um, to not be prosecuted, to the voter ID laws that have such a um, disenfranchising effect on so many eligible citizens um, to you know laws to make it harder to collect taxes to laws to make it easier for corporations to sort of bulldoze over community groups and community input when they come into a community there's lots of different laws so as you can tell I don't like it I think it's a problem but I also think um, and particularly the the fact that it's a way for legislators to come and get in one hand a bill a model bill and in the other hand a campaign contribution check is really problematic. Um, at the same time, groups that want to speak for the less organized uh, members of our society like oh, the majority of the American people need to be doing the same thing. And there is, um, in terms of really coming up with legislation that shows, uh, that would be in the public interest and being much more organized to try to get to state legislators to give them ideas and ways to promote the public good, and that is happening. Um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, what's difficult about our trade laws is that so much of it, with the exception of NAFTA, really, so much of it happens out of the public debate. And we are going to really need an entirely different vision for global governance of trade, of uh, climate-affecting industries, of labor, of capital, of finance, and we are really very far behind on that. And the organization to help privatize the gains and socialize the risks of globalization has really very much outstripped um, the organizing to, to do the reverse. Uh, yes, right here. For, I just want to let a student say. <laughs> Maybe you're not a student. <laughs> I just wanted to ask, um, kind of in the spirit of intersectionality, mm -hmm. um, where uh, public education mm -hmm. um, falls into play in kind of this democracy and the economic policy that you are talking about. Because mm -hmm. um, I know economic influence and corporate influence and public education is a hotly debated topic, right. but what, what are your thoughts on that? Are you talking about K through 12 education or? Okay. Um, 
So I think that the debate that's going on right now with K through 12, the phenomenon, the, the transformation of K through 12 education in our country is really where many of these issues actually come to roost. The, the way that we see what's um, appropriate for children who don't look like the powerful decision makers in our society, um, the way that we see really kind of A, the last big pot of money in state budgets that doesn't isn't dedicated to you know Medicaid and Medi to Medicaid and I mean if we include uh, corporate taxes um, corporate tax breaks that's another big pot but that's sort of a an absent pot right but of course it's a big actual expenditure because it's foregone revenue we are seeing a sort of run on that asset that public asset, which is, has been a bipartisan um, agreement that we should pay collectively to a certain degree for the education of our children. And of course, it's only more important now as, in fact, you know, people are needing the education of our children to be a public good and not just a private cost at younger and younger ages um, because uh, women, frankly, are working. There is, I think, a, the fact that the conversation about what makes a good school, about what, how we can evaluate good teaching, intelligence among three, four, five, nine, twelve-year-olds has become so dominated by market language and values. It is so dehumanizing, just that. And it really is uh, where I think our generation is being deeply cheated out of something that should be an American birthright, which is a decent education and the promise of being able to fulfill your potential. Um, you know, I think we really need to look at decoupling property taxes from public funding. I'm sure that's probably not a radical idea in, this, in these circles. Um, because we simply can't have the kind of inequities we have and we can't have the, the solution to the inequities be these sort of market solutions that are ultimately very unaccountable. Um, it's a complicated issue. Because I, you know, I think you can find parents and teachers and administrators on all sides of them, and people who actually do have the best interests of the children at heart on all sides of these issues. But if you step back from it and look at sort of the the march of organized interests and sort of where their support is from, and you look at the language that's being used, and you look at the solutions that are being pressed, it it really does feel like it's all a part of the same march away from the common good, away from recognizing a common humanity and dignity and towards a market system that puts people in that hierarchy from a very, very young age. Yes. Um, <clears throat> if you think about the people who make rules mm -hmm. um, are supposed to be doing public service. Yep. And how much money it cost them to get into a position of public service. Mm -hmm. What are solutions about having people who really have the public good in, in mind and are not already at the top of the economic echelon um, and, and, and believing a generation who said that people who have should support the public good? How do you get a pipeline for ordinary people when the media is going to strip them bare from the time they were 10 yeah. um, to, to participate in, in the public debate and work for the public good? I promise I didn't plant that question, but uh, it's, a, it's a very, very good one. Um, so just here in New York State, we have an opportunity to do something at the state level that would really help that. The rules that we write for how campaigns are financed, uh, 
how elections are administered, but really how campaigns are financed are ultimately within our power to change. And having it be a market-based system where people who can afford to buy access to a politician can do that, like people who can afford to buy a nicer car can do that, it's a choice. And there is a bill in Albany right now to publicly finance elections, to create a small donor matching system so that the people who can um, only afford to write a $5 check or find the $5 in their wallet and give it to a community member that they support to run for office, that that donation would be matched to a degree to which it could compete with a $100 check or a $200 check for someone for whom that's no big deal. And the effect of that in states where we have public financing of campaigns at the state level, um, Maine, Arizona, Connecticut, are that waiters, waitresses, janitors, school teachers run for office and they can win. And it makes a huge difference, often in terms of the kind of policies, and it makes a huge difference in terms of the kind of access that check writing lobbyists are able to get with elected officials that they've helped put in office. Um, when you simply evade, change, create a new system. So that is completely possible. It is constitutionally permissible, even under the, uh, the corporate court's um, Citizens United decision that has made it very difficult for um, some campaign finance restrictions and limitations. Um, but to have a voluntary system, um, like the New York City system, actually, um, would be a huge step forward for New York and would really change the dynamics in Albany. Now, that's something that I think people aren't as aware of as they should be, that this bill is possible. Governor Cuomo has made a lot of noise about being supportive of it, and it's certainly something that you should contact your state rep about. Sure, we time for one more question. Yes. Hi, um, I mainly wanted to ask about uh, your, you mentioned like the Harvard implicit bias test, mm -hmm. which I'm not very familiar with at all. Mm -hmm. And firstly, I was wondering if it was grouped generationally at all, or, or if you knew, or if, um, if it was, if there were differences across generations yeah. in the extent of the implicit bias, and yeah. also, um, kind of as an extension of that, I was really interested in your idea about um, that in order to achieve a shared social contract, we would have to like acknowledge uh, that we have a categorizing tendency and a, um, embrace that in trying to achieve it. And I was wondering if you would say that since we do have this innate categorizing tendency, do you think it's inevitable that to have, to create categories that disadvantage some groups and advantage others, or that eventually, at some time in the distant future, even though we innately always will have this categorizing tendency, the categories could not be detrimental for any one group. That's such a great question. <laughs> that was a great question. Um, yes, I think it's possible. Um, okay, so the implicit bias test at Harvard, um, I have not seen a report breaking down by, uh, by age group. And, and by the way, they do tests that are about race, that are about age, that are about gender, that are about disability, that are about ethnicity. Um, on explicit avowals of tolerance, our generation scores much better than previous generations. That's not a surprise. Um, there is actually a really rich sort of nuanced um, study that is out of the Applied Research Center. And I think their website is arc.org, A-R-C.org. And it's called Don't Call Me Post-Racial, uh, What Millennials Think About Race, um, which you should take a look at. And um, Yeah, so that's a really so that's really good because it's it's sort of a much richer, just generation focused um, study about about how our generation views race, at least at an explicit level. Um, I can tell you that the idea that our generation.
because we're more tolerant, because we've grown up in the post Jim Crow era, because we are so diverse, you know, is sort of past it all is is not true. Um, I, I think hopefully we all recognize that. And I think that it's it's been a real challenge for our generation because we don't have a name for what racism is in our generation. I mean, we really I, I watch television sometimes and it's like, you know, someone will say, you know, I'm the only Indian girl in the room, or like, you know, isn't it funny the way, you know, there are all those Indian people who are doing that, and all these African American people are doing that, and they'll say, oh, stop being so racist. And it's like, they're actually just acknowledging that people are there with different skin colors and different, and different ethnicities. It's not actually, that is not racism, right? Um, and so we don't have in our just sort of common culture a way to talk about what racism is. And I think actually from, we've both decided that racism is, you know, old racism is, is Jim Crow, is lynching, is being obviously like unwilling to, you know, share the same water fountain with someone from a different color. And then there's something new, which is sort of just acknowledging race or talking about race or playing the race card. And then there's something that's not really racist, which is just talking about culture and being like, well, that's just so ghetto. And, um, you know, making stereotypes that are really funny to us. And that's in our culture. I mean, that like hipster racism is very strong in our generation. And I think it's our difficulty in naming what's, what is racism today? What is prejudice today? You know, that there is something called unconscious bias that is why it makes, it's funny to us to talk in stereotypes and it's uncomfortable for us to name it, um, to name race and to talk about race um, is, is something we have to deal with. It's our, it's our specific version of the racial discourse that we have to really start to own and process. And I think the fact that you know, the Supreme Court is taking this radical reactionary colorblind um, reading, false, insane, ahistoric reading of the Constitution is going to be sort of a galvanizing moment for our generation to have a conversation about what it really means. Um, and then in terms of, um, wait, so that was the first part of your question was how does it break out? And the second part of your question was, oh, are we, we're always going to categorize, is it always going to be hierarchical? I have to hope no, um, I think, but I think it's going to take work to, um, it really does feel like it's funny, because I've, I've done some, some work over a period of year with um, some activists who are white activists who are very progressive and they're people of faith and really working through talking about how race interplays with the public education fights they're doing, with the taxes fights they're doing, with them, you know, with their own community organizing, with their internal culture. And something a woman said once really stuck with me was, I have to get to the place, and I finally have, where when I have a thought or an association and I catch myself, I kind of laugh at it and say, wow, look at that, look how I did that. Look how I assumed that that African-American man wasn't the boss in this organization. Look how I assumed that that woman was not going to come and do the economics presentation, but she was going to be doing the childcare presentation. Look how I, you know, right? And laugh at it and not create further anxiety about it, further shame about it, but acknowledge it and be sort of constantly on the lookout for it, and this is for people of color to do as well. Um, and that it, that's like, a, it was, it was, it opened my eyes to see the way she had sort of found a way to both acknowledge her unconscious biases and yet not become sort of trapped in them. And I hope that as a society we can do that, that we have a common enough discourse where it's not going to take these ridiculous flare-ups like Skip Gates and Shirley Sherrod and Reverend James Wright, where we have these flare-ups of a racial conversation where the right wing has its response and progressive communities sort of struggle. 
And we can recognize that those moments happen all day, every day in our lives. And that we have to check them, we have to do more to deal with the fact that there is a massive racial and ethnic and gender inequality in this country, that our policies have to be tailored to help even the playing field, that we have to actually work at integration again in this country, in our housing, in our schools. Um, but I absolutely think it's possible. Thank you.